In an experiment, especially in a statistical experiment, you should be able to recognize selection bias. And by definition, selection bias occurs from an unrepresentative sample. Let's start with the first example of a selection bias, which is under coverage. By definition, it's an aggregate representation of certain group in the sample. Let's say you are interested to find out if you are the most popular person in your school, and what you did is you just texted send out a text message to all the people in your phone book and of course this is going to be an under coverage because it's not going to represent the entire school it will only represent the group of people in your phone book which most likely going to be your friends the second example of selection bias is non-response bias it is unwilling or unable participants as a possible sample some Examples of non-response bias are surveys that's being done using phone calls or through mails because there is a possibility that there will be people who will not return calls or who will not answer your call or will not return your text messages and they will be the non-response bias of your sample. So you need to watch out for this particular bias as well. And the third one will be a voluntary response bias. It is self-selected or self-selected volunteers in the sample are usually present in your sample when you work with this particular bias. An example of which is, let's say in a radio station, the DJ um, takes a poll on a certain topic and only people who have a strong opinion to that particular topic will make the call. And the people who uh, don't have any um, view about that particular topic will not even bother calling. So this will be voluntary response bias because we know that only uh, people who are interested to uh, give their opinion will call the radio station. There are two variables that you need to watch out for when you're working with an experiment. And these are the lurking variables and uh, confounding variables. Now what are the difference between the two? What we know is that lurking variable and confounding variable will affect or will have an effect on our result or on our experimental design. So the first variable, which is the lurking variable, it is a third unseen variable that affects observational studies. And uh, an example of a lurking variable is let's say you made an experiment or in an experiment or a research, it says there that there's a positive association between sales of ice cream and drowning. Now when we talk about positive association, it means the independent variable is going up and the dependent variable is also going up. So if the sales of ice cream is going up or the number of people drowning is also going up. And uh, the reason, let's say in this particular experiment, is that when people hear a lot of people drowning, they tend to buy more ice cream because they're feeling depressed or probably drowning because the more ice cream they eat and when they go out for s swimming, they uh, drown because of the ice cream that they've eaten. So of course this is just an experiment or just an example and uh, the lurking variable that is being considered in this particular experiment will be the summer heat temperature. We don't know that um, the rise of ice cream sales and drowning would probably be attributed because of the summer heat temperature. The hotter it is, of course, the more people who want to uh, feel comfortable by eating ice cream and uh, when it's also, or the weather is also hot, there are more cases of people going to the beach and therefore the probability of people drowning is also higher because of that. So that is a lurking variable. There is a third unseen variable that you need to look out for. Now, confounding variable, by definition, is a variable that affects the response variable and is also related to the independent variable. Let's take an example of this experiment. Let's say that when I'm stressed, I get grumpy, although we know that I'm always grumpy every day. But in this experiment, um, I am associating stress to my grumpiness. And what we don't know is when I'm stressed, I tend to uh, drink more coffee. And when I tr drink more coffee or more tea, I uh, lose sleep in the process. So uh, we are not really sure what is um, attributed to my grumpiness. Is it because of the stress? Or is it because of the stress brought about by the caffeine intake 
and the lack of sleep that I'm having because of a coping mechanism that I'm making or doing to uh, relieve stress. And these are the two uh, variables that you need to watch out for when you are working in an experiment. Now, the principle of good experiments requires you to have control, replicate, and randomize. To control is to uh, make sure that you can avoid or eliminate confounding or lurking variable. And to replicate, it means to uh, create more samples or to, well, not create more sample, but you need to make sure that you could have more treatments or more people or individuals that will participate in your sample because the more samples you have, the less variability you will have in your result. So that is replicate. And randomize is you need to uh, use an appropriate randomizing technique or sampling technique to create your sample because in statistics, it's important that you have a reliable sample, of course, to have a reliable or more reliable result. Now, there are different types of experiment. Um, one type of experiment that we are going to have in statistics is blind experiment. And we might be able to do this um, activity in the future. So blind experiment, it means um, one, of the, one of the participants in your experiment is blinded. So we have single blind, double blind, and double dummy. Single blind means the participants do not know which treatment they receive. So for example, my experiment is I come up with a pill that relieves migraine. And since I want to experiment or if I want to test if my experiment or my pill works, I have two groups. One is my placebo group and one is the treatment group. So let's say I ask 50 of my participants to take the placebo and I also ask my other 50 participants to take the pill with an active ingredient. I am the researcher or the scientist and I know that I'm giving uh, the placebo to group A and the active ingredient with uh, group B. However, my participants, both A and B, they don't know that they are receiving placebo or the one with treatment or active ingredient. So that's single blind. Double blind is when neither participants nor the researcher knows who had which treatment. So it's pretty much self-explanatory. Double blind means I don't know what I'm giving to my uh, participants and the participants don't also know if they are taking the placebo or the one with an active ingredient. But how are we going to uh, make this happen if I also don't know what I'm giving to my participants? I would need to hire a third party that would record or give that pill to my participants or to my groups. So that particular party or let's say person C who has the uh, pill with an active ingredient and the p pill with a placebo, he knows what he's giving to uh, my group and then he will collect all the data set and then give it to me and I'm the one who's going to be analyzing and doing my statistical analysis based out of the pills or the data set that he collected. So that's double blind. And the third type of blind experiment is the double dummy. The double dummy means it's an experiment that blind experiment will not work. And how will, or what is an example of a double dummy? So let's go back to my experiment about my uh, pill on migraine. So I have a pill that I develop a pill that would uh, alleviate a person experiencing migraine. And let's say I come up with another product and that product is a patch that you put in your head to relieve migraine. So I have those two products and that two products cannot be blind because I am having or I'm using two independent pro products that has an active ingredient. And this is the blind experiment.